Hey everyone, Paul Moore here from Wellings Capital and Bigger Pockets, and I am so glad to be with you here on a Saturday morning. What a lot of news is going on right now. So, so many surprises in the news, so much trouble in our country, so much bad news, so much good news. It's an amazing time to be alive. It's amazing, amazing time to be a real estate investor. Speaking of real estate investors, I'd love to hear from you. So tell me where you're from. Hey, Devin Leeper, I spoke to you yesterday from Harrisonburg, Virginia. Thanks for joining, Devin. Hey, Jared. Uh-oh, uh the video's distorted, he says. Well, Nikki, our amazing producer, can hopefully fix that. I'm going to get my phone here as a backup in case my internet goes down again. Um, hey, Ruth, good morning. Uh, Nikki, maybe you can put in the private chat if there's any problem. Um, Okay, great. Uh, hey, James from Indianapolis. Hey, Lucas. Hey, Ruth from, you're from Louisiana or LA, one or the other. I hope that doesn't offend you. Okay, today we're going to talk about what to do in the meantime. What am I talking about? What I'm talking about is we all know that real estate investing is very different from investing in stocks and bonds. So, uh, today is Crisis Investing 101. Should I invest in stocks in the meantime? How did this question come up? We're a real estate show. We're a real estate website. Why are we talking about stocks and bonds? Well, um, our own Angelo, uh, I know I said his name wrong. Nikki, help me out here. Um, anyway, our own friend Angelo uh, has written an article about this topic, and the topic from Angelo Romero is opinion. Stocks are a better bet than real estate in 2020. What is he talking about? Well, actually, he's a super smart guy. He's written 244 articles for Bigger Pockets. I wouldn't be too quick to ignore his advice because, like I said, he is right more than he's wrong, even if he doesn't want to admit that. So we're going to take a look at what he has to say today. We're going to look at this slightly dated article by his own opinion, by his own words. He wrote this a couple weeks ago when stocks were in a very different place than they are now. Uh, before we launch into this, we're going to jump into our weekly fear and greed index. So this is seven different factors that are pushing markets in one way or another. Again, uh, January was 89, extreme greed, people buying. Uh, March, it was extreme fear down to six. Yesterday, whoa, look at that. It was up from 47 to 66 last week. Warren Buffett would hate the fear and greed index because it drives behavior. Actually, he would love it in his heart, but he would say he hates it because he loves the fact that people respond, that people buy and sell quickly based on emotion. He doesn't recommend it and he doesn't do it himself but he takes advantage of the fact that other people are doing this. He buys bargains. He buys America. He buys American bargains. And when things are really bad, he's able to pick up deals at a discount. Why is Mr. Buffett still sitting on 130 or 137 billion in cash, by the way? Do you ever wonder why he didn't pick up a bunch of bargains when he could have recently? Let's take a look at that and a lot of other stuff today. And we're going to see what could have been one of Buffett's biggest mistakes today on Bigger Pockets. So here's the unemployment news. Did you guys see this yesterday? Unemployment, they expect it to drop uh, by 8.3 million more jobs uh, in May. And instead, we picked up over 2 million jobs in May. And so jobless as you jobless rate, as you can see, went in 2020. It spiked up to this massive, nasty 14, 15% number. Then yesterday, the new report says it dropped to 13.3%. Surprised everybody. Here is the cumulative gains in employment since 2000, September 2010. You can see all of them were lost. All the growth in American employment was lost almost exactly basically from September 2010 to April of this year. Uh, all the 22,106,000 jobs that were gained over that almost 10-year period were lost. Um, 
almost instantaneously, almost instantaneously since March. But again, the good news, we picked up 2.5 million jobs in May to, I think, everyone's surprise. Uh, here's another chart, again, showing it went up to 14.7% in April, but dropped back to 13.3% in May. So uh, this is breaking it down by uh, sector, unemployment by sector. Again, leisure and hospitality took a massive hit of about 45% uh, in April, March and April, and then picked up 14.4% in may constructions almost back to where it was it's uh they lost about 11 percent, i believe and then they picked up seven percent uh retail uh really hurting I, I think retail is actually quite a bit worse than what this is showing i've seen other charts saying that manufacturing eh, coming back some education and health not back yet business and professional services you know they're uh they honestly came back the least of all, but they also had the lowest hit out of this group. So with all that as a background, uh, let's talk about Angelos, Angelos, Angelo Rumoras. Gosh, I'm really butchering this, Nikki. I need to get his name right, so you're going to tell me later. Uh, here's his article. He makes an amazing point, and he agrees with me totally on one thing. I've been saying this on the show for months. This is not the time to buy real estate. This is a time when there's a big disconnect between seller expectations and buyer's desires, okay? So seller expectations are, hey, my neighbor or this other company sold at you know this cap rate. I want to get top dollar. And buyers are factoring all the risk of the unknown. And they're saying, look, I want to pay, maybe not bottom, but lower dollar. And that, that uh, disconnect is going to cause a significant, um, going to continue to cause a significant number of transactions not to happen. Uh, I talked to a guy yesterday. He said that uh, buyers are asking for 10 or 20% discounts on deals they'd already negotiated, and sellers are giving 2 to 3% discounts. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong, it's just what's happening. So, uh, in other news, home prices went up on an annualized basis. Uh, in May, I believe they went up 5.4% on an annualized basis. It was almost a record gain in home prices. So that's another thing that's going on along with the unemployment data. Of course, a lot of refinancing going on. I don't know if you all saw that uh, mortgage rates spiked uh, half a, th 0.3 to 0.7% yesterday on the news of unemployment changing. Uh, T-bills, T-bonds, uh, rates, they're selling off a lot. So rates went up. And um, so the, um, the unemployment uh, news brought also a big gain on Wall Street. Now, this is a really interesting chart that I love that Mr. Remora did. Uh, this is showing the gains from the bear one year from the bottom of the trough. Uh, the gains in stock prices. Look at September 1929. Now, the September, the 20, 1929 and 1933 stock sell-offs didn't recover till the mid-1950s, till Warren Buffett was like 23 years old. I think it was 1953 till they got back to their previous level. That's stunning, but it hasn't happened since. Uh, look at 1937, again, a loss of 60%, but a gain of 59% in the next year. 2007, again, a loss of 59% at the bottom, but a gain of 68% in the next year. And so uh, we've got all these other data points here uh, showing all these other times, 2002, and then there's other uh, times these are not in date order. And even in uh, 2018, we saw a 20% drop and then a 37% gain in the next 12 months. So does it make sense to buy at the bottom? Well, of course it does. The question is, are you smart enough to buy at the bottom? Are you a good enough player? And do you even believe you should be? So let's look at Warren Buffett. Buffett says, you should buy a stock as if your holding time was forever. 
if you don't want to hold a stop more than 10 days, if you don't want to hold a stop for 10 years, then you shouldn't own it for 10 minutes or 10 days. Let me repeat that. If you're not ready, able, willing to hold a stock for 10 years, you shouldn't own it for 10 minutes or even uh, 10 days or even 10 minutes. Well, if you follow Buffett, then I think he would disagree with Mr. Ramora here in saying that we should buy stocks right now. Now, again, what we do agree on is that it's not the best time to buy real estate. Real estate prices haven't dropped significantly. But what we do agree on is that what we don't agree on is that you should buy stocks for the short term. Now, this chart makes me rethink that. This chart makes me think, gosh, maybe, you know, if we could really figure out where the bottom was, we could see, you know, we could see some amazing gains. But you know what? Um, Angelo says that this article was written a couple of weeks ago and even in the couple of weeks since he wrote it look what's happened at the tail of this we saw a huge drop starting february 21st or 2nd i think it was and then a huge recovery already now if you could have perfectly picked the bottom you could have made a lot of money right now but what we're going to see here is that mr buffett uh, one of our role models, at least many of our role models in picking stocks has not even done so well himself. Uh, President Trump yesterday did a speech and said, look at the recovery of the airlines. Uh, American Airlines, who I'm flying today to Sacramento on, is up 19%. United's up 14%. Delta's up 8.5%. Southwest up 3 JetBlue up 11.75%. Um, Buffett sold off. He, he took uh, six to eight billion dollars in purchases in airlines over uh, 2016 to 18 mainly. Uh, and he sold them all off for four billion dollars recently. So here's a little quote. So he says, Buffett says, I don't know whether Americans will have now changed their habits or will change their habits because an extended period of an extended period, if it happens, we're semi shut down in the economy. He also predicted each carrier would have to borrow 10 to 12 billion, and that'll be repaid from future earnings. Even if business comes back 70 to 80 percent, the aircraft themselves don't disappear. You've got too many planes. So Trump uh, said he disagreed with Buffett. He said, you know, I don't think he should have sold his stock. He said yesterday, he said, Buffett's usually right, almost always right, but this is one time he's not, again, in Trump's opinion. He says American is up 64% since uh, Berkshire sold a few months ago. Delta has gained 54%. Southwest has gained 27%. And United has increased 53%. Of course, Warren Buffett's not thinking about these short-term gains and losses. He's looking at a very long period of time. And that's what real estate investors do in general. We look at a very, very long time period. You know, Buffett says, my ideal holding time is forever. Well, uh, that's sort of the way real estate investors by nature look at things because real estate investors uh, in general are looking at a very long holding period. There's a thing called a liquidity premium or liquidity tax. And what that means is this, if you buy stocks, bonds, mutual funds, you can get in and out quickly. You don't have to hold them for a long time to mature. You have the advantage of being able to get an in and out with the economy. But 93% of people, according to one study, lose money by getting in and out quickly. Every investor I know that gets in and out quickly ultimately ends up quitting, losing money. You also have another disadvantage. Stocks uh, stocks, mutual funds, et cetera, are based on every whim of the market. They might be based on a CEO scandal like uh, that at Uber or when uh, the head of Tesla, Elon Musk, smoked pot on Joe Rogan's podcast. I mean, their stock plummeted. Um, they're, they're subject to the mood on Wall Street, CEO scandals, the war in the Middle East, rumors of war, oil prices, all kinds of things make stocks go up and down quickly, you can lose 10 or 20% of your net worth if it's invested in stocks while you go to lunch. 
As I've said before, real estate investing has a huge advantage. And that advantage is that you, um, you are in a position where you have time to react. You have time right now to prepare yourself. You can learn enough right now from today. If you're just starting in real estate, um, you uh, can learn enough from now till the bottom of the market to be, I won't say an expert, but you can be knowledgeable enough to make a lot of money in real estate. And I agree with Angelo that we should not be investing, that now is not the right time. Um, so his name is pronounced An Angelo. Okay, Angelo. Okay, thank you, Nikki. So um, we, so the, the situation is with real estate, you've got this liquidity premium or liquidity tax. It's not liquid and you're going to have to hold it for a long time. But Buffett in his thinking would say that's a huge advantage because holding it a long time is the only way that he says we should do it anyway. So if you're going to hold real stocks for just six or eight or 12 months waiting for real estate to bottom out then pull out your profits and go invest in real estate, then Angelo, I would disagree with you. I would say that that's probably not the best way to invest in stocks. Again, one of my mentors, Warren Buffett, who I'm writing a book about, uh, Warren Buffett's Rules for Real Estate Investors, um, would say that that is not the best way to invest in stocks. Could it work? Absolutely. It sure could. If you would have bought airlines at the bottom and sold them yesterday or maybe next Monday, you would have made a huge profit. The problem is, like Buffett says, investing is easier to understand in a rear view mirror than it is through the windshield. We can't know the future. We, should, we could say, oh yeah, well, I could have predicted that. Yeah, easy to say now, but very, very hard to, uh, to know. There's much more certainty in my mind by waiting to the bottom of the real estate market and uh, investing then. So the question of this podcast today, of the show is, what do you do with your money till then? And I'd like to throw that out and ask you guys, what are you doing with your money till then? What are you doing? And then if somebody reminds me, maybe Nikki or one of you all can mind me toward the end of the show, I will tell you what I would recommend you doing with your cash until real estate bottoms out. And I really do believe it's going to bottom out probably in uh, probably 18 months or possibly a little later. Real estate takes a long time. There's a lot of reasons to believe this. Um, I watched a great webinar this week by Ken McElroy. You can check it out at kenmcelroy.com where he does a 34 minute webinar predicting how unemployment is going to return to normal, how long it'll take. He says six years, if everything booms, it'll take six years to get back to normal. His logic simply says, in a booming economy, we had 200,000 jobs a month. If that's true, and if about 40% of the people don't get their jobs back in the short term, he actually predicted up to 42% of the people would not return to their current job that they just lost. So out of every 100 people, 42 will not go back to work at JCPenney or The Gap or the restaurant or whatever. Those businesses were lost, or at least those jobs were lost. If that's true, it's going to take six or seven years at 200,000 jobs a month to make up those 42% of the jobs lost. I believe that's 12 million jobs. So anyway, you can do the math on that. You can check it out yourself. If there's a six or seven year recession, we're going to have some amazing, unbelievable real estate deals in the future. Uh, so like Angelo, I would say, uh, I would say that, um, that, that right now would be the great time to put together your tribe, put together your education, put together your team, your followers, and be ready for a great uh, opportunity in real estate in 12 to 18 or more months. We've done graphics in the past showing that uh, it might take uh, it might take years for it to hit bottom. I mean, if it even if there is a huge run up in foreclosures in the coming um, 12 to 18 months, prices will probably not hit bottom for 
uh, a number of years. In fact, in the 2008 recession, it took three and a half years from the worst part of the recession to hit the bottom in prices. And so uh, I think the same thing will likely happen here. So I'm done rambling uh, and I'm ready. I'm done mispronouncing Angelo's name and I know I did it wrong again, but I would love to hear from you. What are your questions today? What do you want to talk about? And let's go for another uh, 40 minutes on that. So uh, Stephen Holiday. Hey, Stephen, I've seen you here before. Thanks for joining. I usually buy and hold stock. There are companies that are part of my 20-year plan, but when American Delta worth dimes on the dollar, I couldn't believe the feds would allow the entire industry to go south, right? That said, Buffett is right over decades. There will be Uber flights and the giant flying tube will be a thing of the past. Now, I don't know anything about Uber flights. Stephen, is that for real? That's that's pretty interesting. That's a great thought. And Stephen's now posting a YouTube video as well, so you can check that out. I think you could probably um, Google that. So Tim, Tim Gavigan, thanks for joining again. Tim, my cash is in a government money market account. Lousy interest rate, but it's safe. I don't think that's a bad idea at all. I really don't think that uh, a money market account will be a bad place to be right now, given the fact that we're going to see uh, amazing opportunities in the coming years. I really, truly believe that. Um, who else? So uh, Vicky says, you really think it will hit bottom? Yeah, I do. I think things are going to hit bottom, uh, but I think it's going to take two to three years. And if the government forestalls it, then it could take much more. Manu Shetty says, I have mostly in savings and money market account. I've also been waiting to sell stocks and chunks regularly soon. I will just be sitting and watching. Okay, great advice. I think that's a great way to go. Thank you for commenting. Looks like Colorado in the back. Maybe I'm wrong. Hey, Tu Fang from St. Paul. Tu Fang, our thoughts and prayers are with you in St. Paul and Minneapolis with all the pain that's going on there and across the country right now. Thanks for joining today. What are your thoughts about stocks that invest in real estate? I guess that would be REITs. These publicly traded funds seem to be paying high dividends right now. There's some discounts in REITs. So uh, real estate investment trusts, some people say REITs, some people say REITs. Um, I, I think that it's pretty likely that uh, there will be uh, some discounts and it's something you should be taking a look at. I don't, th they don't have the tax advantages of uh, privately owned real estate, number one. And number two, they do go up and down with the market. Both of those make me nervous. And number three, you can't really always see a direct connection line between operations on the ground and what comes into your bank account. So without that direct line of connection, again, I prefer private investing myself but I know people have made a lot of money in REITs. Jared, J-Rock, welcome back. Are notes a good investment at the moment or are stocks still a better option for the moment? Well, you just kind of blew my cover here, Jared. Uh, I was gonna talk about this toward the end, but I'll just say, uh, if you can find uh, an investment in non-performing notes right now, uh, our good friend, Bigger Pockets, longtime author and blogger, Dave Van Horn. He also wrote a book on investing in private notes. And maybe Nikki can flash that up on the screen. Um, I think that would be a great place to invest right now. And one of my problems with investing in notes has been it locks your money up for many years and you have to pay tax on it. That's usually true. Dave Van Horn's book, Real Estate Note Investing, um, you can find at the biggerpockets.com forward slash store. Thanks, Nikki. So <clears throat> um, the, the benefit that Dave Van Horn and others have made available now is they're making a lot of these more liquid. So you can actually get out of notes in certain PPR note funds uh, in a shorter time. So I'm not here to promote just Dave Van Horn and Dave's fund, but he's the one I'm most familiar with and bigger pockets. Uh, if you've been around any time at all, you've seen Dave on their podcast. You've seen him write articles. He's done a great job. And of course we have the book I just referenced. So that's actually what I would do. If I was gonna tie my money up for six to 12 to 18 months, uh, I think I'd put it in a seven or 8% uh, 
uh, fund where I got a seven per eight percent return, and um, in a note. So I would not invest in the notes directly myself. Uh, I would leave that to the experts, and that's why I would rather get a seven or eight percent return with Dave than a return like my good friend Chad Corbett says he's getting like eighteen percent by investing in notes directly. If you already know what you're doing, go be like Chad and do an investment directly. But if you don't know what you're doing, it's always better, in my opinion, to invest with an expert. DL says, you said that if a person learns real estate now, they can be an expert in 12 to 18 months. I didn't necessarily say an expert. I think I said you could know enough to make a lot of money. What specifically do we need to learn? Specifically do we need to learn and where is the best place to learn it? So I'm not saying this just to advertise bigger pockets, though I love bigger pockets. Uh, bigger pockets has been the best decision I have ever made in 32 years in business. Uh, joining bigger pockets, becoming a pro member uh, or a premium member, some people have done that, is the best decision I've ever made. It's the best place to learn the most. The bookstore is amazing, the forums are amazing. Getting involved hours a day on bigger pockets would pay you great benefits. There are other ways to get involved. You can become involved as a deal finder. You can become involved as a partner in a company and raise capital. You can um, you can learn from a lot of podcasts and blogs. You can hire a coach or you can actually hire a mentor. Now, a mentor is someone you know who doesn't pay you. You don't pay them. You go work for them for free. You know, let's say five hours a week, for example, and they teach you the business. A paid coach, on the other hand, is someone who you pay a fee to and they will teach you the business. I have paid a $25,000 fee twice in my life and I'm about getting ready to spend it, uh, about that amount of money a third time. And those have been some of the very best investments ever. And so, uh, but thank you. Uh, again, Vicky says, how much do you need at a minimum to invest in notes? Vicky, I don't really know. Uh, I think you'd have to check with PPR Note Fund or some of the other note funds. William Petto says, uh, can you give a word about the future of malls and stocks like Simon Property Group in particular? I don't know anything about Simon Property Group. Group, I do know that the REITs uh, that own malls are really, really struggling right now, and they're going to have to figure out another way to repurpose a lot of the space. Will it be self-storage? Will it be even in senior living? I don't know how that space is going to be repurposed. I think malls have a long, rough road ahead. And um, thanks for the question. Jonathan Visbar says, how quickly can you get out of notes? Well, typically it's years. But uh, right now, um, you know, like I said, PPR has options to get out in, I think it's 60 or 90 days. I don't know how to get out any quicker than that. There may be other note funds that, um, you know, that you can get out of more quickly. Thanks for the question. Uh, Monica Puano says, your thoughts on using the CARES Act to move money from corporate 401k to have cash available for real estate investment deals? Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, just take into account the possibility, Mona, that in, is, is it 24 months or 36 months when that money has to be back in your corporate 401k? Ask yourself this, are you willing to pay the 10% penalty and the tax if you can't get it back in time? Let's say you get your money tied up in a real estate deal. It's supposed to be refinanced. You're supposed to have the cash back in hand in a year and a half. Let's say everything goes downhill and or, or let's say for some reason you can't get that money back. Take into account, would you be okay? Would you be okay if you had to pay that tax and that 10% penalty? By the way, there may be forgiveness on that. They may extend that 401k further, but you've got to assume that, you, that they're not going to extend it. Jason Underall says, uh, can you speak about where you see rents going? Um, Jason, I'm going to quickly look at a chart here and I, I, I'm not ready to pull this up, Nikki, but um, there is, uh, yeah, you can, we can look at this chart real quick. So this is a Green Street commercial property indices. Uh, manufactured homes have done really, really well. Self-storage has done well. Industrial has done well. 
Uh, that's probably not the chart I should have pulled up, but it, it does show you where uh, I think what's happened in the past. And uh, it doesn't necessarily show what will happen in the future. But I personally believe that uh, single family home rents, um, here's another chart here, industrial um, self-storage, net lease. Okay, so single family homes uh, are predicted by Green Street to go up 8% between 2019 and um, 2022. Uh, apartments, on the other hand, here's the chart I wanted. Uh, apartments, on the other hand, are predicted to drop by 7%. And that's net operating income. But of course, rent drives the net operating income. So this chart is the one I was looking for. Um, and so single family homes will likely go up from index of 100, uh, 100 in 2019 to 107. I think I said it wrong. And apartments, according to this graph, will go down from 100 to 92 over that same three years. That makes sense to me. I think in certain markets, certain classes of apartments, it'll go worse than this. And then in some, it will go better. And of course, who really knows? I don't know. But that's the best prediction I can make, Jason. Art says, in real estate investing, should we focus on capital returns or rental yields? Uh, if you focus, Art, on, um, on rental yields, which is cash flow first, in theory, the capital returns will follow that. So I would say focus on cash flow. Uh, people who have focused on cash flow in the past have usually done better than those who focus on appreciation. If you focus on appreciation, it's more like speculating than investing. I know that there have been apartment investors in the last five years who have been willing to overpay for apartments because they really believe that they can just sit on it for 12 to 24 months. And unless the musical, unless the music stopped in the musical chairs game, as long as the music was still playing, they could flip that apartment and just bank on the cap rate compression. Cap rate compression alone will allow appreciation. But if you are left when the music stops, like it did in the end of February, early March of 2020, then you can be the one holding the bag and then you can be the one to lose if you're depending only on capital appreciation. I'll tell you that my company, Wellings Capital, looks for cash flow first, and we look for very high debt service coverage ratio. You can go look that up. It's DSCR. It's also called the debt coverage ratio, DCR, same thing. And it's the margin of safety between the net operating income, that's gross revenues, minus expenses, that's the net operating income. The difference between that and the principal and interest payment is the margin of safety. And that's represented by the debt service coverage ratio. So dividing the net operating income divided by the principal and interest payments should give you at least a 1.3 uh, or so debt service coverage ratio. That's a 30% margin of error. That sounds like a lot, but it's not maybe as much as you think. Banks want at least a 25% margin. We like to see projects that are 1.8, 2.0, Right now, we're averaging 2.33 uh, debt service coverage ratio. And again, that's showing the strength of the cash flow compared to the debt payments. Uh, Capricorn Way, welcome back. How do you find subject to properties? So one of my favorite topics on the show is talking about lease option sandwiches and subject to properties. It appears that there are going to be incredible opportunities. My friend Chad Corbett, one of the smartest guys in real estate investing and another Bigger Pockets, uh, can, uh, not a contributor, but a member, he told me the other night he thinks that the opportunities in subject to and lease option sandwiches will be unbelievable. The, 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 most, uh, the easiest way to build a portfolio of residential properties um, is and, and small multifamily is to learn how to do subject to properties and lease option sandwiches and lease, lease to own type deals. You can learn that from a book called Real Estate on Your Terms by our friend, our Chris Prefontaine, our Bigger Pockets contributor and friend. You can also learn that from our Bigger Pockets contributor, Joe McCall 
who is a lot on the forums. He has a thing called Wholesaling Lease Options. That's a book he has. Um, so how do you find these? Number one, you look for properties that have been on the MLS for a long time. The owners are probably discouraged. Maybe it's vacant. It's been sitting on the market for a year or two. You, you can possibly go in and offer to take over their mortgage and rescue them. Number two, you can go and uh, look for properties who are hitting the courthouse steps. They're about to be foreclosed on. There's going to be a ton of those in the coming three years. And so as soon as they hit the newspaper and they're about to be foreclosed on, you can go knock on the door, stand way back and say, hello, ma'am. Hello, sir. I hear that. Uh, I'm so sorry to hear that your home might go to the courthouse steps. I'm here to help you if you want to rescue your credit. And then you can explain to them how you can take over their mortgage and uh, possibly get them out of a bad situation. Now, here's a brand new idea. Um, if you are ready and today to start doing subject to properties, why don't you go on Airbnb? Airbnb owners have been really in trouble for a long time. And, and I mean, when I say a long time, I mean, three months, it seems like a long time now since we've been stuck indoors. Um, Airbnb people are in big trouble and they don't know when they're going to get out of it. And so people who have bought Airbnb properties or they're, you know, they've got a property they've converted to an Airbnb. A lot of them are really in trouble because a lot of them moved to a nicer home and they took their former home and they had counted on Airbnb to work forever. Or a lot of them took a duplex or a fourplex and they converted it to two or four Airbnbs. They're in trouble. And instead of pinging them through the Airbnb website and saying, hey, do, do you have a coffee maker? Do you have a blow dryer? Um, does, does your fridge have blah, blah, blah? Why don't you ask, hey, would you like me to take over your mortgage and take this property off your hand? Have you thought, has anybody thought of this yet? I don't know if anybody has. But um, I think this would be a great way for you to find subject to properties. You can offer to take over their mortgage. And then once you take it over, you put set the house up as a rental, then you rent it out. Or you do a lease option sandwich and you collect three paydays with the lease option sandwich. Of course, the deposit, the monthly premium you get between the rent and what you have to pay the mortgage. And then, of course, the big payday at the end after two to four years, uh, the tenant buyer closes. And if they close, you get the big delta between the mortgage payoff and what they're paying you. It's the lowest risk, fastest way I know to build a real estate portfolio. Taru TV says, "What from what year to what year was the recession in 2008? Uh, the slowdown started in late 2006. It hit hard in 2007. It hit the bottom in the equity markets in September, uh, September to March of 2008 and 9. The bottom, the floor of the home prices was January, February 2012. Haha, <laughs> reminding real estate investors why we have a lot of time to be ready and to be able to make some great deals. I hope that helps Taru. Uh, Nikki had just put another question up that I missed. Iwal Jante said, hey, Iwal, thank you for joining. Is now the best time to become a real estate wholesaler? It would be a great time to learn it. You have to have a lot of time on your hands and a lot of persistence. But if you can learn that business, you can uh, possibly be very well positioned to do that. It's going to be an amazing time to either wholesale lease options or wholesale homes in the coming years. If you want to learn to do that, you can again go to Real Estate on Your Terms, the book by Chris Prefontaine. You can go to Wholesaling Lease Options, the book by Joe McCall. Both those are bigger pockets uh, contributors. And if you want a lot of leads, if you want to learn to get a lot of leads to find these type of homes, you can contact uh, a company called All the Leads. Uh, Chad Corbett runs that company. So hopefully that is helpful. What else we got here? AI says, I think these Airbnb will just convert to long-term rentals. Sure, they might. Flooding the long-term rental market, decreasing the rents. Hmm, hadn't thought of that before. Uh, Single-family homes are actually predicted to rise 
and actually do fairly well in the coming period here. People want more space than they had in apartments. Uh, people might have lost their homes because they lost their job and they still want to live in a house. They want to keep their kids in the same school district. So in theory, rentals are single family rentals are going to go up. This theory, however, says hmm, maybe it'll there's be some downward pressure on rents as well. And I think that's a very good thought that I had not thought of. Stephen Holiday says, my realtor said there's lots of folks selling, telling him that they're about to lose their Airbnb house. You know, folks, I think we're just on, I think we're onto something here. I think that if you want to pick up a subject to house, Go to the town you want to be in. Maybe it's like me, Sanibel Island, Florida, or Orlando, and try to pick up a subject to deal. I think it's possible now. I think it's much, much more likely that you'll that you'll have more opportunities later. I think the Airbnb chances are now, and I think the general market, uh, the general home market is going to be flooded with opportunities later. I'm talking about 12 to 18 to 24 months. Jay Choi with a million dollar challenge says, do you think 10 year crisis cycle um, is real? Will it come back in 10 years? In other words, will there be another crisis in 10 years? Jay, you know, these once in a lifetime events seem to be happening about every 10 years, don't they? So think about 2000, 2001, we had a downturn. Uh, we had one in 1990. I'm going back in time now. We had a double dip recession in 79 and 80, 82, uh, early 70s. We had a, a crisis with a stagflation. And of course, going forward now from 2008 to, to now, 2010 to now, about another decade. You know, it's likely, but I don't think there has to be a 10-year time period between each one. It just seems like it's been that way. Uh, and of course, there's always going to be market cycles as long as there are people investing. So Jared J Rock says, thank you so much. I just thought of a new approach to foreclosures on how to help yourself and your person going through the process. I absolutely agree. Thanks, Jared. That's very kind of you to say that. Sean Murphy says, where's the best place for an owner to list post a property for a lease option renter buyer? Sean, you can do that on the MLS. You can actually get on Zillow as well as a for sale by owner. Of course, the MLS, you'd have to have a realtor. Uh, you, But I would do it on Craigslist. I would recommend that you go on Craigslist. Uh, my friends who still do a lot of lease option sandwiches do theirs on Craigslist. If anybody else has a better way to do it, tell me. Oh, yeah, another way. So Real Estate on Your Terms talks about building up a long list of potential buyers from all these sources, from Craigslist, from other places, and then building up that list and emailing them every time you get a new deal. So Sean, I think that should be your long-term strategy. Uh, what can a non, Richard, does, Richard D'Alessandro says, what can a non-accredited investor do? PPR, Wellings, et cetera, are not available to us right now. Just hoard cash. Yeah, there are some opportunities available. Um, let's see, there's a guy, that has a website called the Real Estate Crowdfunding Review, and he has a list of non-accredited opportunities. Um, so you can check that out. Um, you could definitely hoard cash, et cetera. So uh, Sun says, is Dallas a good place to invest in a downturn or should I look at other markets in a downturn? Um, you know, Dallas is predicted to be one of the best, the strongest markets uh, in the recovery uh, actually coming up. And so Dallas, Houston uh, should recover well. Houston's had a lot of hits between healthcare, uh, oil production, and oil logistics. All three of those have hit Houston in the last four months. Now, oil prices are coming back. Did you see the WTI crew the last week? It's really jumped up. Maybe it's going to get back to normal. You know, oil prices... By the time the economy hit the doldrums in 2009, oil prices were back on the way up already from the 30s toward, you know, going toward 110. Um, so 6M Abbott says, does every recession follow the lag time like 2008? You know, they usually seem to, but there's no guarantee that they'll follow that. You know, we talked before on this show about the four potential shapes 
for a recession. And um, I'm here today to propose a fifth possibility. So Nikki, if you want to take a look at the slides here, there's a V-shaped recession, and that's what a lot of people with a stake in the game want you to believe is going to happen. That's a quick down and a quick back up. Ken McElroy explained, kenmcelroy.com, a uh, great apartment investor and friend of bigger pockets. He explained why a V-shaped recession is almost impossible. Um, there's also a U-shaped recession, which means you go down, you bump along some rocks across the bottom of the bathtub, let's say. It's also called a bathtub recession. And then you recover some future date. And that could happen. That happened in 1973 to 75. There's also a, I'm going to jump. No, I'm going to go to the next one. W-shaped recession. That means you go down, back up. Everything looks euphoric. And then down again and back up. And I think there's a pretty good chance that we'll have a W-shaped recession. There's a lot of people right now who want to get out to restaurants and clubs and baseball games. There, there, we could come roaring back, but then there could be another drop. That's a possibility. Then fourth, there's an L-shaped recession. That's where you go down like Japan and you just bump along for like a decade of very, very slow growth. I'm going to predict. Okay, so I'm not going to predict. Calling the shape and timing and depth of a recession is a fool's game. There's no way to really predict it. We just don't know what we don't know, especially in the situation we're in now. But I'm going to suggest a V and L shaped recession. That's basically a starting a, a recovery that comes back quickly. And I think we saw from yesterday's unemployment numbers that could happen. It goes partially up, like Buffett thinks about airlines going back to 70 or 80 percent. And then after that partial recovery in the shape of a V, then an L-shaped recovery from there, okay? So down, 70% back, and then an L-shaped, a long, painful, drawn-out uh, recovery from there. Do I know I'm right? I, I'm almost sure I'm wrong. The question is by how much and in what direction. That's just my best guess. I don't know. Uh, Buffett doesn't predict these things. Howard Marks, Ray Dalio, Charlie Munger, they don't try to predict these things. I'm just saying these are possibilities. We're only really going to know in a rear view mirror. 6M Abbott says Dallas is great, but doesn't get hit as hard like the coastal markets from my experience lived there for 10 years. And so folks, if you want to invest in the worst place, worst places in America, you can pick places like Scottsdale, Las Vegas, California, and lots of cities in Florida. If you want to pick the very best places to invest and make a lot of money in America, you can pick places like Las Vegas, Scottsdale, California, and lots of coastal and other cities in Florida. What am I talking about? What I'm talking about is timing. If you can, if you can pick it just wrong when everything's gone bullish and things are right at the top of the roller coaster like they have been in places like Orlando, St. Petersburg, Tampa, Jacksonville for the last, you know, several years. If you can pick places like that, then that's a perfect place to lose money because the markets typically drop like a rock in those places. If you can pick them at the bottom and even better as a, as a real estate pro, maybe get them below the bottom. And there is, there is a way to get them below the bottom. Um, then you could be positioned for the greatest rise and the greatest wealth building opportunity of your lifetime. For me, I've been running away from Florida this whole decade, but I am chomping at the bit to buy something in Florida, especially subject to in the coming two to three years. I'm going to be looking at places like Gatlinburg, Tennessee as well, but I don't think they're going to have the amazing deals uh, Florida has. And some of you might want to look at places like Scottsdale, Las Vegas, California, Think about the sand states. So to your point, 6M Abbott, Dallas is probably not the best place in the sense they don't have the huge ups and downs. It is a great place if you want stability. And so what else do we have here? So David, thank you. Wes Cordeaux says you're right on Houston. However, knock on wood, I've got 19 rental properties, all single, nice single families. And thank God, everyone is current. Wow even two that lost their jobs. They may be getting help from family, but their payment is of paramount importance. Wes, I'm hearing this all over the country. Thank you for joining us. I'm happy for you. 
And um, I'm hearing a lot of people say this. We're in, in our portfolios, we're seeing the exact same thing across the board in mobile home parks, self storage. Uh, we don't have any apartments right now, but I mean, yes, I'm hearing that from all my apartment friends, single family, the same. Um, I will tell you that a lot of people are making more money right now than they were, you know, on unemployment than they were uh, making from their jobs before. That might change. You know, the end of August might roll around in about three months and we might see some more difficulties. So watch out, Wes. Watch out, everybody. So we're in the last nine minutes of our show and we're going to now. Uh, move into fast gear. So uh, Richard says, what can a non-accredited investor do? Yeah, I already answered that. Uh, I would look for non-accredited deals uh, on places like crowdfunding websites. Uh, be very, very careful with whatever you do, though. Don't just jump into the first one you see. Uh, get the book. Um, get a book by um, the newest book by Bigger Pockets. Uh, and that's Brian Burke's book, The Hands-Off Investor. What Richard, whatever you do, go there first, learn all you can about vetting operators before you invest in any accredited or non-accredited deal wherever you are. David Groves says, I live in South Florida and new in real estate. I see a bunch of opportunities coming also. David, welcome. Welcome to Real Estate in Bigger Pockets. And yes, um, if you're in the in East Coast side, they say the deals in uh, Broward County are going to be better than those in Dade County. Just throwing that out. If you're on the other coast, Fort Myers, Sanibel, uh, find a deal and reach out to me. I'd love to buy there. Manchu Shetty says, while buying through a wholesaler, are there ways to make sure sellers are not being taken advantage of? Can the whole process be made transparent to keep all parties informed? Yeah, that's possible. But you need, you know, you could get tricked. I wouldn't count on that. I would count on getting a really, really good deal. Like Buffett in equities, become a student of real estate, become a student of the numbers, and don't worry about getting taken advantage of. If a wholesaler marks it up $3,000, $30,000, or even $300,000 for a larger deal, you've got to ask yourself, is this a good deal for me? And the only way to know that is by learning the math learning the metrics, learning the fundamentals of real estate. And the best place to do that is guess where? Bigger pockets. Become a premium or pro member and you'll learn even more. We get some, even more. We get some great market insights from uh, being a premium or pro member that you can't get otherwise. And Nikki can tell you how to upgrade and become a premium or pro member on Bigger Pockets in a moment. So he he come almost says, do you think traditional banks will shift their standards in approval refinancing uh, investment properties? So yeah, Nikki was going to show you how to upgrade to a premium or pro level, and she's going to do that while I try to answer this. Um, yeah, you know Wells Fargo and one other large bank, but I can't remember who it is. Uh, one of you correct correct me on it. Just said recently that they're going to stop doing HELOCs. And so again, as I say every week on here, uh, I recommend you going to your local bank, your local credit union, your regional bank, and developing relationships with them right now and getting set up to do a HELOC, which is a home equity line of credit. And by the way, that is, in my opinion, that, that's, that's the answer to a question we asked like 40 minutes ago, and that is what to do with your money right now. Why don't you get a HELOC? Use all your cash to pay it down as low as you can. As long as you're sure they're not going to pull the rug out from under you, you can't really be sure. But, you know, local credit union, regional banks, much less likely to do that than a huge bank. And then have that money you're paying down. You know, you're basically investing in your own self and your, you know, your interest rate. You're investing in your HELOC. So you're actually saving money every month by paying it down, but you've got all that money, all that cash ready to go um, when things uh, hit the fan here. So David corrected me, he said it's July 31st, not August 31st, where federal assistance ends. Thanks. And you're in Broward. Okay, great. Wes says, oh, forgot to add, um, almost all are free and clear, not the best use of funds, but my advanced age of 68, I sleep very well. That's awesome, Wes. Congratulations. Um, Nikki had another question for me that I missed. 
Chris Allen says, hey, Chris, welcome. Are you saying you want to buy multifamily or single family and subject to in the coming years? Well, it's not really easy to do a subject to commercial deal, and that would be five units or above. So I'd be doing single family up to a fourplex, Chris, and that's what I'd recommend. Jeremy says, thanks, Paul. Great content and feedback on the questions. Thank you, Jeremy. Hey, and thank all of you. Uh, I'm amazed that I get to do this. I'm so grateful to Bigger Pockets, so grateful to Nikki and all of you for joining me here today. Uh, as for me, I'm getting ready to hop on an American Airlines flight in two hours and head to Sacramento, where we're going to be vetting two operators. We take Brian Burke's advice very seriously in his book, The Hands Off Investor. We spend a lot of time uh, vetting operators before we'll give them a dime. We fly out to meet them in person. We see how they treat their employees, see how they talk about their investors, see how they talk about their spouse. Uh, we do everything we can to vet these operators before we give them a dime of our money and our, um, our clients, our investors' money. So that's where I'm heading out. That's where I'll be this weekend. I'm also going to see my daughter in Redding, California. And that's going to be fun. And I'll hope to see you back here next week. I'm going to answer a few more questions before we wrap up. Somebody asked, is a 40-unit self-storage cost-effective to automate? Henry, great question. Thank you for asking. It's the perfect size to automate. And especially if you can uh, you know, use some of the new technology. Uh, I wrote a book called Storing Up Profits, Capitalizing on Capitalize on America's Obsession with Stuff by Investing in Self-Storage. And I talk about in there that in there. Um, you should use the new technology, which would be smartphone driven. It's much, much more cost effective than the $32,000 kiosks that they were doing a few years ago. And I'm really sorry to you, those of you who make those kiosks, they're just somewhat dated now. Um, so uh, any advice for Canadians, Danielle says, I actually don't know. I think that Danielle, thanks for joining from Canada. I would think that the same things that are happening in the U.S. generally are happening in Canada, except the uh, foreclosure rate and the bad underwater debt rate of residential in Canada is much, much lower than the United States. And so I would say you might want to consider getting David Green's book, Long Distance Investing from Bigger Pockets and Learning to Invest Long Distance. So thanks, 6M Abbott. That's nice. Um, uh, okay, so we have any other questions before we wrap up? Aaron says, I'm in contact with turnkey providers in markets that I like. I live in California and would be an out-of-state investor with very little time to do a full-time job, with very little time due to a full-time job. I know I can make more money on the buy deals if they're not turnkey. Um, but if these meet the 1% rule, is there any reason not to go turnkey? So all I'm going to say, Aaron great question is check references, check reviews, really, really know who you're investing with. There have been some really, really bad turnkey deals in America the last couple of years. And some of those people are actually potentially going to go to jail. Fly out there to see the property yourself. I mean, sure, do it on Google Earth, do it on Google Maps, check the crime in the area, use your Bigger Pockets Pro or Premium membership to use Neighborhood Scout at a discount to check out the neighborhood. But get on a plane, use your frequent flyer miles or fly out there while flights are cheap and check out that property in person. Uh, I would not buy a property turnkey without doing that. All right. So, hey, again, it's been my honor to be here with you. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Bigger Pockets. Thank all of you for being here with me on this early morning on the West Coast, late morning on the East Coast. I'm really honored and privileged to be here. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Until then, happy investing. <laughs>